Before showtime, that is around 7.15, we'll let Tragil go because there are preparations that he has to make. Um, and we're also going to be very respectful to make sure that what we talk about here doesn't say too much about what you're about to see because I think we both feel strongly that you should see it on its own terms and see what you think. We, we can talk a little bit about what is generally known and been publicized about the piece, right? Do you feel comfortable with that? Yeah. Before you guys get started, so you know, they're going to cut you off at 7, because you're going to get drowned out by that door. 7, okay. Just so you know. No, that sounds good. Speaking faster. No. <laughs> well, Chanjo, can we start with the choice? I mean, it's an obvious starting point, but I think it would be a helpful one to talk a little bit about your use of the Messiaen score, and your using the title of the score for your piece, and maybe that sets the tone for what the piece generally um, is meant to embrace. Yeah. Um, it's a long process coming <coughs> to the idea to do a piece t using Messian's music and entitling the piece and actually making the work be entitled Quartet within the time and therefore stating that I am making a work to this music. Although, as you will see tonight, it's not a traditional format. I don't, we don't press play for the music and then do a dance to all the music. But it is the primary of music. But I really started from um, the initial ideas came from trying to consider sincerity and the possibility of sincerity on the contemporary dance stage today and what would be the conditions for, um, how, what conditions would be necessary in order to problematize or to, to uh, begin to create the possibility of sincerity on the stage, you might say. And so um, the first thing I was starting with, I believe, was, um, as we talked about today, was nudity. Um, because, of course, dance is about the, one of the primary materials of dance is the body. And there had been a lot of dance that I was seeing at this time, and I'm thinking of um, 05, 06. Um, there was a lot of nudity, and I was looking at a lot of work internationally. I was traveling as well, and, and so I was seeing it a lot. So nudity was one of the things I was looking at in terms of its sincerity and its use on the stage. And um, way before this, I had heard this piece of music. I'd been in Tower Records and had listened to, you know, they had these listening stations, and I, I was in the classical department, like, you know, pushing buttons. And I heard this piece of music and I couldn't take the, you know, you, tr you know, you'd want to leave because you have something else to do and you don't want to spend 45 minutes standing on one of these things. I stayed the entire time. Obviously, I, not obviously, but I bought the piece of music. And I listened to it, I just kept, I loved it so much. And I immediately thought, okay, there's no way I can make a dance to this music. This is just too much awe and too much in it. And I felt like there's no way I personally could come to this. I didn't feel I had the craft or the skills. And um, and it hasn't been done a lot. I don't know if anyone's done it, in fact, the whole thing, actually. Um, and um, so when I came back to this idea of sincerity, by the time I got to the idea that I was going to make this piece about sincerity, I remembered this piece of music. And I thought, hmm. And he's so, I mean, it's such a piece of sincerity. I mean, he was, uh, the story of the piece is that I don't know, do you, do you know the story of this music? Why don't you mention that, because I think it's important. <coughs> Messiaen was, um, was in the French army. He was a very well-known composer in France in the late 30s and 40s. Um, not as famous as he was later, but he was well-known in circles of classical music. And, um, he was captured. They were fighting in Germany. He was captured. He was put in a Nazi prison war camp. And the camp is not in Poland, but the camp was in Germany. 
uh, Stalag 7, I believe it was called, and it was a camp where, in fact, there were a number of artists, and the Germans actually used this camp as an example to the world that they were cared about culture and were doing good things. In a way, they it was one of the camps that they used to kind of mask some of the other stuff that we know that they were doing in other kinds of camps. And uh, there was a guard there who knew, recognized Messian's name and knew of his music, and so he snuck him pencil and paper, and he would go into the latrine every day and write music. And they did have performances, but this was kind of, Messian had a very special relationship in the camp. Like, for some reason, he was allowed to do these, this guard made it so he could do these things. Like, there were other artists, and there were other performances, and other events, kind of, but no one was allowed as much as Messian to go off on his own and, and, and really do his art. And so at a certain point, he was ready to show this piece. And there were other musicians in the camp, and they, for the first time, performed this piece of music in January 5th, 19, maybe January 5th or, 19, or 9th, 1941, in this camp. And there's a lot of mythology around it. And, and Messiaen's first description is that there were 5,000 you know, Nazis and, and prisoners listening to this music. And he felt that he'd never been listened to with such attention. And people heard this music. People never heard classical music. And, and at this time, this was very radical music because he was really changing the harmonies and melodies. It was extending, 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 extending notes. And um, so, and he was also a very deeply religious man. And so the piece was based on a, a line from Revelations, a uh, scripture from Revelations. And of course, he says that the, this piece is, he also commented that the piece was not about imprisonment. It was not the but the piece is called Quartet for the End of Time. So of course, there are issues about time, imprisonment, and all these issues. But, um, and clearly death. death. And clearly death, and the possibility of death, and, and, um, and everything that was born around in the, in the world at the time. And I think that, um, so when I realized that I was going to make a piece and I was investigating this research about sincerity, I thought, is there a way that I can, this Messiaen could be, and I originally, um, thought that I still wasn't going to use the music. I thought I was going to use the story of the music. That was my idea. Okay, well, I'll tell the story of the music. And it took a while in the process before I was had enough. Um, I don't know. It took a while before I felt that I could. I, I made the choice to just try to bring the music in. It was very clear once I brought it in that I was. It's interesting that you should say you were going to use the story of the music because what's so what I found so masterful about the way you used the score, which I, I saw the piece last night, is that you almost use it as as part of a designed composition. That is, you don't do an illustrative strategy, you don't do a sort of beat for beat, certainly strategy, but you use it. You use not just the music, but its concept and the very beauty of it. It's really beautiful. As, as a design element in this completely choreographed um, um, uh, experience that you have for people in there that includes text and sound and bodies in motion and sometimes emptiness, you know, is a whole layered, layered um, substance. Yeah. Well, I think, again, it, it went back to the fact that, you know, I, I knew I had this, you know, there was a real question of how do you use this music because it's 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 so vital and I was so it's so beautiful and, and I really feel that one of the objects of the piece because I don't think Messiaen is, is well known as a lot of classical um, um, composers and I really feel that part of what I hope the piece does is introduces um, my audience and people who come to Messiaen and the beauty of this music so. It was, I, I knew that I could not use it in a traditional way, and so I knew I had to come up with different strategies and different ways that the music was completely integrated as, not as something which accompanies um, um, movement in the traditional sense of dance and music, but was an element of itself that it had, you know, uh, you know I thought of it as architecture, I thought of it as Landscape. I thought of it as its own body that was on stage that that had to that was a part of it, you know. And so I, 
this was clear to me. I was not going to even try to make a piece to Messiaen in that traditional way, so I knew I had to come up with different strategies. And so you used nudity. I mean, we don't, we shouldn't give away the whole thing, but there is, can, can you tell how nudity worked into this, how you used nudity, how, it, how, it, how you manipulated the idea in your artistic process to get to what the audience was see? Yeah. Um, well, as I said, the, I had these concerns about um, nudity on the stage. And, and you could say what those concerns were. Were you just seeing people just take off their clothes? And I was really, I mean, a lot of the work actually I saw at DTW. Um, I, I, it was a season 05, 06, and there were a number of artists who were, were my colleagues. And, and, and I was concerned because I felt that it had become very trendy to do nudity. And I felt, I wasn't, sh I didn't understand. And yet you couldn't, like everyone was showing everything, and yet it was completely as if they weren't. We were supposed to pretend that it was so, we were above it somehow. Like we, you couldn't eroticize this body. You couldn't, it wasn't, we weren't supposed to really look, it was, we were supposed to look at it as if there were clothes on a lot of time. And it was very, and I also felt that it was something that the market wanted at the time. The market wanted a lot of nudity in dance. I began to question this, and then I began to realize that perhaps it had nothing to do with the work. I've seen the work was fine. It was my own issue about nudity. And I began to realize that my father, when I was a very young boy, every year I grew up in a small town in Georgia, in southeast Georgia, would take me to the fair from the time I was like four to, I don't know, he stopped taking me to the fair when I had my own car, so maybe it's like 16. This was our thing, we'd go to the fair again. But at a certain point, my father would leave me, and this is when I was a little boy, and he would go into the Hoochie Coochie show, you know, he'd get, get me the cotton candy and be like, and he'd go in the Hoochie Coochie show. And I just knew my father went, because I could read. I saw Hoochie Coochie, but I had no idea that this woman, beside the words, who was naked, was actually dancing naked, and I didn't know, understand. You know, I, it took me until I was maybe 11 or 12 that I put two and two together, I was like, He's going in there and he's watching. There's something, you know, I thought there was something nasty, that my work for it was nasty. There was something nasty going on in there that my father was seeing that I couldn't see. And as I was thinking about this in 2006, I realized that this was my first understanding of, of nudity and performance. And it was completely tied into my relationship with my family. And of course, this must be tied into my relationship with my body, because my father didn't say to me, um, I'm going to watch, you know, some naked women dancing, and I think that this is, you know, artistic or anything. There was no conversation about it, you know, as, as often there is not. And so, I think that this hoochie coochie show became. I said, wow, okay, this is something. Then this is my first. This is a performance form that I should look into. And so as I began to look into it, I realized that it was a perfect foil for the sincerity, because it was a condition in which there was nudity, but it wasn't supposed to be sincere. So I said, okay, this is the first set of conditions that I'm gonna set up as a Gucci show. And then, if we began to, to fulfill, to, to change the content of that, how can we then have a discussion or, or, or have an experience about sincerity and the other issues in the piece? So I really used it as a certain kind of, um, 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 form of problematization. I mean, I don't think you will experience it as problematized, but, but this is what I do as an artist. I have to find something that to kind of ignite my creativity and to get me to go into places that creative I guess we can say. So um, we can say that it, it, what you will see is a hoochie coochie show in my mind. I mean, it doesn't perform itself as a traditional hoochie coochie show, but this is where the research has come from. Mm -hmm. You've had a long time, you've had the luxury of having a long time to develop this piece. Can you talk a little bit about how you've grown as an artist, how your process has developed over that time? You're a young artist, so um, grown by leaps and bounds, and I think we would love to hear a little bit about what it feels like, what it allows. Well, I think that, you know, it, it's, I, I mean, you know, you talk to me on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, like most dancers, I complain a lot. But 
but when you ask me and I put in perspective, it, it's really great. I, I have the, I, you know, I have a lot of the opportunity. I've had the opportunity to really work on this work for a long time. And I've had a lot of support. We have had, you know, maybe 15 to, depending on who you are, if you're a dancer or me or a designer, we've had anyone between 15 to 18 weeks full time, which is quite unusual. And, and, and unless you're a full time company in the United States, you don't really have this. And um, it's really given me the time to sit in the questions, I think. Um, I didn't feel I had to produce as fast because I, I, in some ways, this is a very interesting question because I think that in New York, we, the thing I missed is that in this sense, okay, I had a lot of time. And we get into this structure where, okay, we work every day, except for we have time off like regular people who go to work. In New York, as a, as a, as a you know, as a kind of emerging choreographer, you pretty much work all over the place. You're finding space here, you're finding space there. Sometimes you rehearse at night, sometimes you rehearse in the day, sometimes you rehearse in Brooklyn, sometimes you, I mean, you're all over the place. And that fuels its own kind of creative energy. So then what happens when all of a sudden you have all the space you have, you know, space 24-7, you have a theater like this to rehearse in, and you can rehearse in it whenever you want, and you create a schedule for the dance, and you all go. It, can, it also can become a little boring. And so I had to also watch that, that I really, because I think there's an incredible energy in New York, also from our creativity and this madness that we have that you don't necessarily have other places, because it can become very functional, like a job, but, I do think the luxury to have this time and space, it gives you the time to go deep and it gives you the time to not, you know, to really, and, and I tend to work slow anyway, and I think that it, for someone's work, and this work is very layered, it gave me really the time to really um, not force any layer before it was time. And this is why I'm sitting here, Julie Imperial, it's my dramaturg, and she can tell you that you know there are times when you know one residency could be working on just one thing, and you you don't see any of the a lot of the stuff you see. We just work on one aspect of the show, and it's like to have you know three to four weeks full time just to work on one aspect of the show. You grow because you get to refine in such a way that I've never had the opportunity to do a real a real sense of. And decision making. I think that to have all this time getting in the permission to ask you questions you maybe didn't want to hear. I mean, we, we could take this risk to ask a very difficult question and you know, to make a research and make your own kind Well, it's good to hear because when you're, especially when you're addressing a theme as vast as death, and it's not the most popular thing in. Today's contemporary world, you want a sense of thought out findings. What does it mean now for us? What's going on now? Why do we embrace life and all of that? And I just felt so grateful. I mean, without saying more about the piece, I felt so grateful to be in the presence of a work that did attempt, you know, to sort of address some of life's bigger conditions and questions rather than just show a letter or something or other. Um, and we were this. We touched a little bit on this when we were talking earlier about value in dance. One of my big bugaboos is there's great value in everything that happens in this theater, and sometimes people have a hard time talking about it to people who don't get the value, but who would if they could just hear what should why should we come in here? Um, and it strikes me that this piece really argues for itself strongly in terms of the value of those minutes people will spend in there. Well, I think that. <coughs> I mean, this was a big concern for the piece because when you know you're doing quartet for the end of time, you have to deal with time. And of course, if you're, you're dealing with the things of death and the things surrounding that in the piece, time becomes a, a really important formal element that you, that, that you have to deal with. And that was something that was um, a real big job for us to, to try to figure out the rhythm of the piece and how it would work on you rhythmically. And of course, these are issues that Messiaen deals with quite brilliantly and geniusly in his music. And so originally, when I came to DTW, <laughs> yeah, for me, the idea was the piece was three hours. 
Um, you told that to Carl. Car yeah. Car yeah. Car yeah. 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 Told them it was three hours. You know, they went okay. You know, when we were trying to figure out how we were going to work with the audience, and it, this is, when you do a three-hour piece, it's, it's, it's a practical issue also. Of, the theater isn't used to having a three-hour piece. It changes things around a lot in terms of staffing and things like that. But they were very supportive. And, and it's not three hours. It's, <laughs> it's not three hours. It's, been, it's gone through. It became two and a half. It became two, and now it's actually okay, an hour and a half. Yeah, it's its own great one. Yeah, and I think the you know the value. I mean, again, it, it's it's um. Your question was. I didn't have a question. Yeah, we were just talking about <laughs> value, I guess. Um, I think that that's a lot of what the piece, by its very nature, is complexifying. That's probably not a word. That's a wonderful word. word. Complexifying. You know, is that's where we start. I, I started this piece, and I won't say I won't say too much about this either. But I started this piece in a choreographic research lab. Well, I started the research my own thinking and research at the beginning of 2006, and then I went to a choreographic research lab in Vienna at Impulse Tons Festival in the summer of 2006, and I made a study there that was looking at the value in dance, and, and I was this thing about nudity. And so that's, out of that came this question of sincerity, and so I think that's what the, 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 the piece is perplexifying, it's like, well, value, and like, how do we, Sincerity, like, is, I mean, on a formal level, I mean, there's content, but on a formal level, I think that, like, there's a lot of, right now, I didn't see, and that's what I was seeing, I didn't see that people were putting so much value in a kind of search for something really truthful in dance. And this is very complex now because we're living in a different time, and the modern dancers were very concerned with the truth of the self. Okay, and so postmodernism comes around and basically truth becomes relative and what do we do? We, life becomes complex and we, I felt that we were just kind of hanging out in irony with nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I started this piece. I wanted to find out, well, can we be sincere on the stage again and be taken seriously? Because most of the time if you make a sincere piece, people are like, oh, so naive, oh, so old fashioned, you know, oh, please give me a break. You know, people really want you to go, you know. And so I, that's what we, tr we really kept trying to answer is, well, where is the value? How can you change the value? And when you do that, how far can you push it and it still remain contemporary, that it speaks about the ethos and the, and the, and the quality of experience in our time? Because, of course, I didn't, I, I know how to make a modern dance. and I, I and, I really love old school modern dance, I really do. And that could be what, but that, that's not the experience I wanted to do. I really wanted to make something that was about the complexity of our time and at the same time to see if it could be sincere because this was not something I was seeing on the contemporary dance stage. And it was something I was longing for. It was something I was truly, truly, truly longing for. And I think I, I just return so often to Toni Morrison's words that you have to make the kind of art that you want to see. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, you can't keep sitting in these theaters complaining about everyone's work and why is it there. Like, you've got to do it because you, you, you're, you, you know, you're very good at your own sense of irony. You know? So it was quite a challenge to me to change my values and the value of what I could put on this stage. And of course I was afraid, you know, that it wouldn't, I don't know. I'm not so afraid at this very moment, like uh, afraid, but it's a big risk. To but it was a big risk for me, and I didn't know if people would support it, and because um, it's not the trend. Let me tell you, it's, it's, it's not the trend right now. This might be a good time to um, open it up for a couple of questions, and I wonder if anyone um, has any. The um, well, they think of. Did you have it? No. <laughs> One quick question, because I really appreciate it. I'm really happy that I came here to hear you, because it uh, makes me um, have uh, be more optimistic about what's going on in the world, to, to be able to hear somebody who is so, um, cares so much about sincerity and putting it through the dance, because 
it's true that uh, dance hasn't been dealing with that. But my question is, I think, is it true that uh, you have two performances? In what? They're... Take off. Yeah, like yesterday and today? No. Are there going to be more performances? <coughs> Saturday? Saturday afternoon, I have an ongoing project, which I do at different, I mean, there's this piece, Quartet for the End of Time, the cinema theater, and on a Saturday afternoon up in the, um, up in the studios, there's another project that I've been working on since 2001 called Tickle the Sleeping Giant. It's an ongoing, pro it's a per what I call a permanent work in progress that's developing over 20 stages. It will never be finished. It's an open modular form, and once it's finished, it will be. Once we finish the 20 stages, we will no longer perform it. And it deals with different issues. That piece is really about looking at. It's a, it's a performance research. It's not a work of art. Um, it deals with the relationship between how cool gets written on the body, the sense of cool, and its relationship to the praxis of. of the theoretical idea of realness in the voguing dance tradition and the practice of early postmodern dance. So it's it's a research, and oftentimes what's interesting for people, I think, is is or this this project has been a kind of laboratory for me that later fuels the work, the the arts that's on stage. And it's, it's I wouldn't say that it's um, some people disagree with that, and some people say that it. I don't need to make that distinction. Some critics say that, especially nowadays, that things are much more open. They say, well, this is art too. You don't need to say that this is just research. Research can be art. I think there's a little bit of a difference, but I, I don't believe that the artist's intentions necessarily are the thing itself, so we can leave that open. But it's a very different thing. It, and each time, it, it presents itself differently. So that's always a surprise. So I say, Come if you're ready for adventure. That's good sense. I mean, if you be, if you're not, if you are not doing the performance very often, and you have this lovely long time to produce it, how come you there will. are few performances? Well, you're, that's a good question. Although I want to return to something else you said about optimism, but you will find another set of runs for this thing that you're about to see tonight elsewhere, right? It can be toured, or it can be brought back, for instance, possibly here, or somewhere else in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a valid thought, and that goes to value, too. You spend all this time, you get a piece that you're happy with, or you're proud of, and that's a big problem in dance, and as you know, in some over-fetishized dances, ephemerality, like, oh, isn't that lovely? And it's like, no, it's a great tragedy that we don't, that these things can't live and breathe and work. But I love that you responded to the optimism, because even acknowledging life's, you know, the end of life and the end of time, which is pretty, like, staggering, that you still find, there's still, you still find a kind of, someone asked Trouchel last night about faith, and um, and, and then we only had a short time, so it couldn't be resolved. And you said, yes, I do have a kind of faith. And I wonder if maybe there's a faith in continuity, a faith in the value of getting up every day. I wonder if you could expand maybe on what you're being so generous with in there through this piece. Well, I feel, you know, I think that the elements of this piece heighten it. I mean, because of course these are the questions. If you could just go back to this music, these are the questions that Messiaen is obviously facing in this situation that he's in, and many people are facing at this time, which isn't so unlike our time now, like you said, you know, in terms of the intensity of, you know, what's going on in the world, but, you know, it's very fundamental for me. I think I don't make anything that I feel like does not privilege the idea that life is worth living. I really just feel that that's what my, I mean, I'm not saying I'm always successful at it, but I feel that there are two agreements that I have with my audience. I don't feel that people come to see my work because they're going to like everything or love everything. But I feel that the people who follow my work, the two things they know is that, one, I have really done the research and searched for a truth that I want to share. I don't, I, I don't, I won't trade that in for anything. I mean, it's relative, but 
that I feel that it's a very old way of thinking about being an artist, but I feel that that is my role to go on that search and journey and to bring something back and share it with an audience that I've discovered. And the second thing I think is that that, that is all toward the belief that art can be a kind of handmaid in artist, all of our journeys on this planet. It's hard. Life is hard. I mean, there's no doubt that it's, it can be heavy. And I think art sometimes is the thing that can get in there and just wake up that little part that says, okay, you know, where this event goes, it says, okay, the sun is like, oh my God, the sun is shining. What a magical thing. That in itself is something incredible. You know, and I think that dance can do that. You know, and great dance can do that. It makes it and I think we all need those things. I mean, we, I mean, I'm sure everyone here, we all have our moments of peril, you know, and sometimes they're more frequent than others. And I believe in art, you know what I mean? I, I'm not, I, I think there are other things that do that, and I would never say that art is medicine. I would never say that art is religion, you know, but I do believe that art can be one of those things that just helps us and supports us and as human beings on, you know, in life. And, and, that's, and I think people know that. So it's not just the thing that like, I just do this thing and it's just like, okay, whatever. It's a real serious vocation for me. Are there other questions? And I'm around and after the show, you, well, you know, I'll be around. I'm not in it, so I, it's a great chance for me to be available. I, I love this opportunity, because sometimes I'm in the show and it's much harder to be available. So if anyone has questions or want to say something, have come after the show, um, I'll be in the lobby around. Well, thank you for speaking with us, and thank you for giving us a work of art that makes us understand how much art matters. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. conversation is actually next Thursday with Luciana Ashugar and it's being uh, led by Victoria Anderson Davies. So please come back and spread the word about this program. Thank you. Have a great night.